The Holy Gospel according to Mark, the seventh chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around him, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat until they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups, pots, and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites. As it is written, this people honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly, all these things come from within, and they defile a person. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Beloved of God, grace to you and peace from the one who created us, redeemed us, and moves among us still. Amen. Well, if you have been around the last few weeks, you know that I and others have been hyping the fact that today was supposed to be the first Sunday that we hear our pastoral intern Erica preach at Grace, and they called me about midday on Friday to let me know they had tested positive for COVID. So they are as heartbroken as I am that they are not sharing uh, the word with you this morning. You get me instead, for better or for worse. Um, but I do ask that you keep Erica and their spouse, Elle, and especially baby Cadence in your prayers, that they would stay free from COVID, um, especially that little one in their house. So as Pastor Eric mentioned, these last uh, four weeks, we have been moving through a sermon series that we have been calling Bread for the Journey. And most of this series has flowed from the sixth chapter of John's gospel, which starts with that well-known story about Jesus feeding 5,000 hungry people with just five fish and two little loaves of bread. And Pastor Terry helped us reflect that morning on Jesus as the bread of life, who nourishes us and satisfies our deepest hungers even better than cake for which Grace has a special love, as Pastor Terry noted. He said uh, that Sunday that um, this maybe love for cake and for sweets is actually part of the DNA of this congregation. And folks who were here last Sunday remember the cake that was on our altar as we came around the table of celebration in honor of our fourth graders. And Mav, who was at, up at the altar again this morning, was very curious about whether it was chocolate or vanilla under the frosting. So Jesus, bread of life, cake, might have been a toss-up that morning. <laughs> um, and then we had two back-to-back -back Sundays about eating flesh and drinking blood. Thank you very much for the relatable content, Jesus. Two weeks ago, we talked about, um, in the context of that eating flesh and drinking blood story, we talked about all kinds of other biblical stories about eating and drinking and about how Jesus' love and grace is actually too big for words. It can only be embodied. It can only be enfleshed, as it was for me many years ago by the women who fed me and nourished me with breakfast and stories around a rickety table in the Mexican squatter settlement where I had served as a missionary. And then last week, Pastor Eric reminded us that these teachings about feasting on a flesh and blood Jesus are so hard that even the disciples start to turn away from Jesus because it's just sort of too much for them to take in. And Pastor Eric reminded us that it is only at the cross where we eventually see that choosing to follow Jesus becomes impossible for all of us. And when that choice is erased, that is the moment where it all just collapses into grace, 
and into this beautiful invitation to eat and drink and be filled with the mercy and the goodness of God. And this final Sunday in our Bread for the Journey series pulls us out of the Gospel of John and into the Gospel of Mark. And the story we heard this morning is not so much about bread itself, but about how we eat it. We listen into a debate of sorts between Jesus and a group of religious rule makers called the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees in Jesus' time were a small elite sect of Jewish leaders who tried to incorporate their faith into every aspect of their lives. And these followers of God were very worried about how some of Jesus' followers ate their bread. Specifically, they worried about how the disciples washed their hands, or actually how they didn't wash their hands. The Pharisees worried that the disciples were dirty. And according to their own religious laws and traditions, that was actually true. The disciples hung out with dirty people, and they did dirty things. And the disciples didn't wash their hands afterwards, either literally or metaphorically. The disciples hung out with prostitutes. They spent time with tax collectors. They ate with the poor. They touched and healed the sick. And they did not wait around to make sure that the temple system approved of those actions before just going ahead and doing them. And neither did they apologize for those actions or ever disavow the people that they served. And because of that, the Pharisees said that these disciples were not clean. And it seems to me that Jesus must have been a little bit angry about that, actually. His disciples, after all, had left behind their homes and their families and their careers to worship God in all aspects of their lives. In other words, the disciples were working hard to do exactly what the Pharisees purported to do. Yet unlike that elite 5% of folks in Jesus' time who had access to abundant drinking water to say nothing of access to bronze kettles, these poor farmers and fisher folk have to make do with what they have, so they eat with unwashed hands. Big deal, Jesus says. There are many more important things at stake. And responding to the Pharisees' chiding in his characteristically earthy fashion, Jesus explains that the law is like food. That which is useful, we should digest, and that which is unuseful should end up in the sewer. <laughs> Now, to hear any rules or any law or even human tradition compared to sh poop must have been shocking for the disciples to hear even in a private conversation. In fact, it's still shocking enough today that the people who put together the lectionary, the cycle of readings that we read in our congregation most Sundays, chooses to actually leave that part out of the gospel reading for this morning. But that's what verse 19 says. Regardless of whether we read it out loud today or not, the point is clear. Jesus thinks that the law, the Torah as a whole, is good and useful. He also thinks that rules and traditions all about religion should get flushed down the toilet when they get in the way of people experiencing and sharing in the crazy, extravagant, generous love and mercy of God. I've been thinking about our own religious rules and traditions quite a lot lately, especially as it relates to our practice of Holy Communion. And that is mostly because, as you've gleaned here through announcements and through Pastor Eric's Sermon on the Steps, that we have been immersed in conversations about communion at Grace this August. We rejoiced last Sunday in our Communion Celebration Sunday with 28 fourth graders who completed communion instruction the, the, uh, this summer. And there were about 450 people in worship here last Sunday across our two worship services and another 125 or so families who joined us online, which means there was a ton of support here for our kiddos as they celebrated this really beautiful faith milestone. It also means that there were a ton of different communion traditions represented here in our congregation last week. Actually, there are a ton of different communion traditions represented in our congregation every week, whether you knew that or not. About half of our Grace members and friends grew up in Lutheran traditions, 
which means that about half of us didn't. We come from Catholic and Methodist and Presbyterian and Disciples of Christ and Evangelical and non-denominational and even Jewish traditions, to name just a handful. And some of us didn't really grow up in church spaces at all. And that diversity of backgrounds is one of the things I love most about our congregation, actually. And it means that we don't always all start from a common story when it comes to communion practice. Most of you, if you've been around Grace a little bit, know by now that we practice what's called an open communion here at Grace, which I'll say a bit more about in just a few minutes. But it wasn't always that way. Here or in other churches that are rooted in this Lutheran theological tradition, there were a lot of rules involved. For example, I know that a number of you here this morning grew up in Lutheran congregations where you were not allowed to receive communion until you had been confirmed. And for most of you, that was like eighth grade, kind of at the earliest, right? In the Lutheran church that raised me, we took communion in fifth grade, but we weren't allowed to do that until we had had a special class. And of course, learning about the sacrament is important, but I don't know that our head knowledge actually changes the experience of what Christ is up to in the practice at the table, but that was the rule. We also only had communion once a month when I was growing up, apparently because having it more often would make it feel less special somehow. And although people from non-Lutheran church backgrounds were allowed to receive communion in the church, or in the threat of Lutheranism anyway, that I grew up in, those people were still supposed to be baptized members in good standing of their own congregations. So lots of rules. Now, if you um, don't come out of a Catholic or an Orthodox background and have visited one of those congregations and maybe came forward for communion and had the priest offer you a blessing instead of a wafer or a piece of bread, you probably were a visitor in a Catholic or an Orthodox church. These church traditions have different kinds of rules grounded in a very specific understanding of what happens in communion. We are going to go super church nerdy together this morning and learn the word transubstantiation. That's the word that, um, that underscores the belief in the Catholic and Orthodox traditions that the substance, though not the appearance, of bread and wine undergoes an actual material change in Holy Communion so that it becomes the actual body and blood of Christ. And this is such an important theological distinctive for our Catholic and Orthodox siblings that they only welcome folks to the table who have received proper instruction in that doctrine and who um, confess the same belief in it. And if you're curious about that technical word for how Lutherans understands what happens in communion, that word is consubstantiation. And now you know two Jeopardy answers for somewhere in your future life. Consubstantiation, that is, that the bread and the wine remain bread and wine, but that Jesus is truly present in and with and under those elements when we celebrate communion. And of course, there are lots of other churches and lots of other traditions when it comes to whether they offer communion at all and how often who can receive it and who can't, and what it means when churches do offer that sacrament. And there are all kinds of reasons for all of those traditions. And some of those reasons are even good reasons, just like there were good reasons for the Pharisees to insist on a ritual of washing hands before they ate. But I have been wondering over these past couple of weeks about whether all of these traditions don't kind of make Jesus side-eye us a little bit in exasperation. Historically, church institutions have put so many conditions on feeding God's people at this table that we lose what Episcopal Bishop Bill Swing calls the crazy hospitality, the open extravagance of the Last Supper. And that, in a nutshell, is why Grace and lots of other churches like ours has moved toward this practice of open communion where all are welcome without exception to this feast of forgiveness and healing and mercy and grace and community in Christ. It's because rules that put limits on God's wild and expansive grace seem to be of the sort that Jesus would invite us to flush down that proverbial toilet, 
Now, don't get me wrong. We are far from perfect here at Grace. We have a lot of other unwritten and unspoken rules and traditions that probably feel exclusionary, especially to newcomers. And it seems to me that a lot of those kind of unwritten rules are about ascribing to certain social standards that were historically deemed appropriate for church, right? Things like what people wear to church or what kind of language is appropriate to use inside a church or about how people of all ages should or shouldn't move their bodies or use their voices. And I think it's good for those of us who have been swimming in these church waters for a really long time to wonder together about these rules that we often can't even see anymore because we've been around here for so long. And then also to wonder whether it might be important for us to let go of some of those rules, to not wash our hands, so to speak, in order to be closer to the things that matter, in order to be closer to Jesus, who desperately wants us to meet him in the folks who are not already part of our in-group. A bunch of us, as Pastor Eric mentioned, have been reading Sarah Miles' book, Take This Bread, as our final summer book club uh, selection here at Grace. And if you haven't picked it up, I highly recommend that you do that in your own time. It's really, really beautiful. But for today, I'm going to leave us with one final quote from Sarah's book, because her words seem to me to sum up this morning's reading from Mark. She writes, I walked away reflecting on all the ways religion tried to manage and tame God. Through compulsive rulemaking, magic rituals, good behavior, and the sheer weight of church tradition. It was so tempting to try to turn gospel into law, she writes, wisdom into knowledge, But there was Jesus, the Word made flesh. There he was, over and over, seeping away his followers' attempts to codify and regulate their experiences of the divine. He'd spit in people's eyes and stick his fingers in their ears, touch unclean women and corpses, yell at religious authorities, and impatiently demand that people drop their church going and give the poor everything they owned. Don't be afraid, Jesus would say. It's me. Come on, let's go. Amen.